Hello and welcome to this episode of the Duke Law Podcast. I'm your host, Jake Charles. At Duke Law, I'm the Executive Director of the Duke Center for Firearms Law and a lecturing fellow. I teach and write on the Second Amendment, and I'm also a proud Duke Law alum. On November 3rd, all eyes were on the Supreme Court as oral arguments got underway in the highly contentious gun rights case, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association against Bruin, widely noted as the High Court's first major Second Amendment case in more than 10 years. While the spirited hearing focused on an individual right to carry firearms outside the home for purposes of self-defense, many wondered if the 6-3 conservative majority would give those conservatives a swift right turn on gun rights. To help unpack this wide-ranging discussion, I'm bringing in the big guns, as you might say. My fellow colleagues at the Duke Center for Firearms Law, Professor Joseph Bloker and Professor Daryl Miller. Their scholarship is among the most highly cited in the Bruin case. Professor Joseph Bloker is a Lanty L. Smith, 67, professor of law at Duke Law, a noted Second Amendment scholar and an expert on gun rights and regulation. Professor Bloker recently co-authored When Guns Threaten the Public Sphere with Yale Law Professor Reva Siegel. Professor Daryl Miller is the Melvin G. Shim Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Intellectual Life here at Duke. He has published in leading law reviews and been cited at all levels of the federal courts. Professor Miller also co-authored Second Amendment Rights, Regulation, and the Future of Heller with Professor Bloker. There's a lot to talk about here. Please enjoy the discussion. Professor Bloker, Professor Miller, thank you for joining me on the Duke Law Podcast today. Thanks for having us, Jake. Yeah, it's great. This is going to be a great discussion, so let's dig in. You've indicated that you don't believe the New York law will stand, yet the justices also gave the impression that they're interested in a somewhat narrow ruling, and none of them suggested that permitless carry would be constitutionally required. What do you think are the most likely outcomes when the ruling comes down? I do think that the New York law is likely to be struck down. I think gun rights advocates have reason to feel confident uh, uh, after the oral argument. Um, but I do want to emphasize what you said there. I don't get the sense that there's an appetite on this court to, re- to, to do away with permit requirements entirely. So I think the real question is going to be, what does it take to make a permit requirement constitutional? And maybe that means you got to do away with or limit the discretion of local licensing officials. Maybe it means, I don't think so, but maybe it means na- nationwide shall issue and states are going to kind of play around with what factors go into the to the shall issue regime. But um, I do think this law is going down, but I don't think it's going to be a radical expansion in, or it doesn't have to be at least, a radical expansion in, in public carry rights. I, I totally agree with, with Joseph on this. I think it's pretty clear that the law as written is going down. The real question is, you know, on what grounds and how broadly the court will strike it down. And what that means to me is that the real questions are the are the knock on effects. That is a really broad ruling uh, that ends up striking it down with some fairly loose language. It's going to implicate all other kinds of areas of Second Amendment concern, like what kind of guns are protected you know, who is protected, who can carry guns, that kind of thing. So I totally agree on the issue about this particular law. Yeah, it's going down on the issue about how broad it is. I think that's where the real action is going to be. Right. And did we learn anything from the oral arguments about what the divisions might look like in this case if we assume that there's at least a majority to strike down the law? And especially, what do we learn about the three newest justices, Justices Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Justice Amy Coney Barrett? It, to me, it felt pretty much like Gorsuch and Kavanaugh had tipped their hats. I mean, Kavanaugh's already on the record of saying that he thinks that a text history and tradition only approach is the, is the only legitimate one. And I think Gorsuch seems to have signed on to that. I think Barrett was a little more guarded uh, on that issue in terms of the reasons why you might have an unconstitutional, why it might be unconstitutional. In terms of like thinking about, you know, an outcome and, you know, what a majority looks like, they might end up all converging on something that would be very Heller-like, which is to say, like, under any theory, under any methodology, this is unconstitutional in some sort of categorical way. And that would be, you know, great, I suppose, for the petitioners here. Uh, not so great for lower courts and legislatures that have been looking for more clear guidance exactly on what is and is not constitutional. 
I mean, I would just add quickly on top of that, I mean, I agree with everything Daryl said, that um, J- Justice Kavanaugh seemed really, really perturbed by the level of discretion that he perceived here. Like that was really sort of a bugbear for him uh, at the oral argument. Justice Gorsuch, uh, likewise, like Justice Kavanaugh, asking a lot of questions about history, setting up the uh, challenger's lawyer to talk about his view of the statute of Northampton and so on. But he was also, this is Justice Gorsuch, was also seem really upset with what he perceived the lower courts have been doing in Second Amendment cases. And he, and he, he said some things at oral argument, which I think are not accurate about the degree to which they are rejecting historical approaches. Or I mean, you remember, did you, you remember this, Daryl? Like, it, was a, it was an odd moment in the argument that made me wonder really how much he's paid close attention to what's happened in the lower courts. And Justice Barrett, I guess I'd just say, I thought she asked some really canny and interesting questions about, um, you know, why can't uh, this is this was a question directed to Paul Clement, the challenger's lawyer. Like, why not just concede that Times Square, for example, on New Year's Eve is a sensitive place and therefore exempt from the reach of the Second Amendment? That's put that would have been a big concession, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think it would have been a big concession. But, you know, I think on the, you know, the issue about what the lower courts are doing. Uh, it really goes to some of the work that uh, that you that you've done uh, in sort of researching the the rise of this idea of you know the Second Amendment being a second class right as a kind of rhetorical maneuver if it's not really necessarily borne out in practice. And so uh, the fact that it seemed to get some play during oral argument just shows the success of the the framing that took place prior to this case. Right. And so you mentioned, Daryl, and talking about uh, some of the methodological questions in this case about how the Supreme Court is going to tell lower courts to evaluate Second Amendment challenges, this test of text, history, and tradition, which is a test that uh, Justice Kavanaugh advocated when he was a judge on the D.C. Circuit that looks only to those kind of three um, guideposts to evaluate the constitutionality of a law. And uh, a question for both of you was, how well did that test, did that framework hold up under the questioning, especially by Justices Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor, who pointed out, in this case, the long history and tradition of Things like prohibiting concealed carry of weapons and deference to state legislatures. Uh, Justice Kagan even noted that the history goes back and the history actually uh, supports the opposite of what the challengers are arguing for, which is a right to carry concealed as opposed to open carry. Yeah, well, Daryl and I are kind of on record on this one because we filed a brief uh, in this case uh, in support of neither side, but arguing against the adoption of the text history and tradition test. Uh, anyone interested in the long statement of our views can find the brief online. Um, but uh, in general, I came into this oral argument skeptical of the test. I think that a lot of the questions at oral argument showed why it would be a hard test to apply. I think that the justices seem to be leaning in the direction of adopting it. The majority of them do. But they also seem to be, interestingly, like conscious of and attentive to the difficulties of this kind of historical analysis. I mean, J- Justice Thomas had the first question, and his question was it, something like, you know, if, if we're going to analyze this law under this text, history, and tradition test, we're going to have to do it by analogizing to historical laws. What should we look to as the analogy? Which, you know, was maybe pitched as a friendly question, but it's also a really hard question because, as Daryl and I have pointed out um, in this brief, which we fought along with Eric Rubin of SMU. That, that analogizing across time is really, really hard in this space. And it set up a lot of questions about things like, well, what about Yankee Stadium? What about Giant Stadium? What about Times Square on New Year's Eve? And I think that's where the where the doctrines are going. But I don't know. I mean, it didn't look good to me, but it did look to me like the justices were headed there. Was that the same read you had, Daryl? It's really hard to tell. I mean, I think it's possible that we'll get a text history and tradition only approach. And I think we should emphasize it's the only part, right? Because... Uh, even the two-part framework yeah. begins with a kind of text history and tradition, you know, evaluation. It's just that it, it's not the sole metric for how to determine the constitutionality of a of a regulation. I think the difficult issue would be like if, in fact, there are justices that are leaving the door open for a more conventional two-step framework where you have some kind of tailoring analysis or some sort of protection analysis in step two an opinion that doesn't make clear that that's still on the table is going to be read exactly the way you describe as this was a text history and tradition only approach. And the uh, marching orders for lower courts is that is exclusive rather than inclusive. And let me just add one thing, which is that when this case, when, when, when review was granted in this case, the Supreme Court narrowed the question presented to not just the broad question of public carry, but concealed carry in particular. And I think Justice Kagan was picking up on this when she asked the question of Paul Clement, the the challenger's lawyer, 
look, you're telling us here that we have to reverse what the historical trend and the historical tradition was and grant you a right to get a license to carry a concealed weapon in public against this historical backdrop where even Heller itself said concealed carry can be banned. How does that square with your argument? And the response basically was to say social norms have changed in the uh, 18th century and this in the 19th century and the early 20th century. Concealed carry was seen as the type of carrying that was not the preferred type of carrying, and now we've shifted to a place where concealed carry is preferable as a type of carry. And one question would be: How do we square that with the historical approach? What kinds of shifts in social norms are allowed to dictate regulatory authority and which kinds aren't? That's more of a rhetorical question, not for you all. I more want to pick up on one of the things that you noted, Joseph, which is Justice Kavanaugh's concern with the amount of discretion in this laws, uh, in this type of law in particular. And maybe just to step back and to put this in, in perspective here, New York's law is a, a type of law that's in the category of may issue licensing regimes. They're called may issue because they give the officials who are the licensing officials discretion to grant a license if someone uh, shows something like good cause or proper causes in New York's case. And they're opposed to shall issue licensing laws where a person that wants to get a concealed carry license has to show no kind of special need and a licensing official has no discretion to deny that. One question for you all is, does a shall issue licensing uh, regime eliminate the kind of discretion that seemed to bother Justice Kavanaugh here? We see some of them, for instance, require things like a determination of good moral, co good moral character, that a person is a suitable person to get a license. I mean, that's an excellent question. And it really, really raises the question about like, if, if in fact, we're on, on the path towards nationwide shall issue, what discretionary authority is left in that kind of regime? So, you know, discretionary authority itself might have things like being a person of good moral character which allows for some discretion, uh, unless it's totally spelled out. But even, even then, there's some sort of interpretive mode. You know, is this kind of conviction or is this kind of temperament uh, which shows that you're, you know, an angry person or a, a violent person, but hey, haven't been convicted, is that, is that sufficient to show that you're of insufficient good moral character, even under a shall issue regime to obtain a permit? Um, and so I think the I th really think like the next wave of litigation might be on these particular aspects of a shall issue regime that have what we might think of as sort of open ended qualifications. And I'll just add on to that. I mean, like I think this is it could end up putting a lot of pressure on the line, which I think we sometimes take for granted between shall and may issue, like as if there is a really clear line. And it's not 100% clear to me that that's true and that, you know, you can make a shall issue regime look more like may issue or vice versa. I mean, Daryl had a good line yesterday. We were talking about this case over lunch about like, you know, even in a shall issue um, uh, jurisdiction, if you were to come in, check all the boxes, satisfy, oh, I'm not a convicted felon. I'm not a... And then we're to say to the licensing official, oh, I got to get this gun today so I can go rob a bank. They're not going to give it to you, right? Notwithstanding the fact that you've satisfied all of the written requirements. And that's, you know, there's going to be some discretion still built into that. I mean, the reason why you wouldn't get the gun it's not a proper cause. That's exactly what this law is, is a proper cause requirement. So I think there's still like inevitably going to be this question of like, what's a quote unquote, good, proper, constitutional, whatever reason for having a gun. And uh, that's, that's not going to be answered by just saying that New York's law goes too far. Let me shift to one of the concerns that seem to occupy a, a good portion of the oral argument, and especially the beginning portion, and that's uh, this sensitive places doctrine. So in the Heller decision, in one of the carve outs that Justice Scalia had for the scope of the Second Amendment, he said that restrictions would be permissible in sensitive places like schools and government building. Uh, we call it a sensitive places doctrine, but of course, that's the only clause we have in Heller that tells us anything about uh, what places are sensitive. And the question is, how well did Paul Clement do with the hypotheticals that the justices threw at him? Uh, was he answering the questions sufficiently in a way that would allow the justices to draw a line? Was he sufficient when he said, that's not this case, and we can decide those questions uh, later? And how do we think about public safety concerns under a sensitive places doctrine? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, um, you know, I think overall, of course, Paul Clement's, you know, a master uh, at uh, Supreme Court advocacy. But um, I think he did get tripped up a little bit in the series of, of case of hypotheticals, you know, is a, 
you know, going to giant stadium is a university campus, you know, in the subway or these sensitive places. I think he got tripped up and he did what he, the only thing he could do, which is say, well, that's not our case. That's the next case. But I don't think that's going to give the justices much comfort if they think that they essentially are going to one at a time have to be a kind of, you know, gun zoning czar for the nation. So it was a really interesting dialogue. And definitely, I think, however the case comes down, if in fact we're getting something that's looking closer to a shall issue uh, regime nationwide, it's going to put a lot of pressure on this very this very undeveloped doctrine about sensitive places going forward. As, as Joseph and I have both written, a sensitive place isn't necessarily just about safety. There might be other kinds of concerns about public participation, politics, elections, religious worship, other kinds of things that might make a place sensitive that has nothing to do with actual physical safety and has more uh, to do with, as, as Joseph has said, the sort of health of the body politic. Yeah, I just want to <clears throat> emphasize the point about the sort of the case by case. Like, I like that line there about like making this essentially a zoning authority for guns, making the courts a zoning authority. Like, that's a terrible idea. That's a terrible way to do constitutional law, I think. And it's especially terrible when you put it together with, and I agree, this was a part where at least if I were a justice, I would have been made uneasy. It's particularly hard when you put it together with the suggestion that all this reasoning should be done historically. Like, that you should identify all these places historically. Like, what would James Madison have thought about carrying guns on the subway? It's not even like the question isn't even legible. Like it doesn't actually like track anything. One of the other interesting uh, points was that Chief Justice Roberts and uh, Justice Kagan were asking questions about places that it would be hard to draw a historical analog about. So the Chief Justice asked about places that serve alcohol. Would it be okay to limit uh, guns in those places? And 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 Paul Clement had challenges with this. He said, probably not, actually. There's probably not a historical analog there. Justice Kagan asked about, what about protests where there's more than 10,000 people? And he said, probably not. That's probably not a place where you'd be allowed to restrict guns. You might. He said, that wouldn't be a sensitive place. You might be able to pass a law that um, survives strict scrutiny, but that wouldn't be a sensitive place. And I think we're going to see um, these kind of uh, challenges coming up if the court strikes down this law. And to your point that it wasn't a satisfactory answer for Paul Clement to say that's not this case. If the justices decide that there is a right to carry outside the home without any showing of need, then what they, uh, well, at least I think they need to do in this decision or what they seem to want to do in this decision is to say, well, where are the limits? If we're going to say that you're going to get a right to carry in public, what what places are, are off limits? And without this kind of guidance of what places are sensitive and how you decide what places are sensitive, it seems hard to draw lines around that. Yeah, I, I think so. And and I think it's worth considering, you know, just how much levels of generality are working, you know, both in the briefing and in the oral argument and probably in the ultimate decision, because that's that's where Judge Jeff Sutton once said that's that's the whole ball game is levels of generality. So you saw that with uh, Clement talking about like the level of generality here is about concealed carry. It's about public carry. You saw that with the level of generality in uh, former Judge Ludig's brief, which is, you know, it's not about permitting of public carry per se. It's about the state's ability to regulate public carry, right? So there's levels of generality going on all over the place. And I think it's fair to say that if, in fact, the court adopts this text history and tradition approach, either solely or even at, at stage one, there's going to be lots of litigation as to what is the appropriate level of generality. Like you can say, yeah, I suppose taking a gun to a giant stadium or to, you know, the horseshoe in Ohio State University can be banned wide because it's kind of like a fair. But as Joseph, you know, has written, that totally obscures the real reason, which is it's hazardous. There's, you know, it's a concentrated population, a large population in one place. That's the real motivation. It's not it's the what how it's like a fair that really matters. One of the things I thought was really interesting at this oral argument, which you see like a lot of the time, I think it's sort of high level legal argument was just these competing frames for like what actually is what's going on here. And with you had these fantastic advocates and these brilliant justices like that kind of stuff happens quickly and it's kind of it can be easy to miss. But one additional sort of level of generality game that I saw going on was like defining 
what exactly is the right that the petitioners are asserting here? Because from their perspective and from the perspective of some of the sympathetic justices, it seemed to be we're just asserting a right to carry in public full stop, period. That's all, you know, under some condition, whatever. But like just this is a case about the right to bear that has to mean something. It has to extend outside the home. And for justices like the chief justice had this in a few of his questions, like if you take that as your starting point, then you start to ask, well, how is it that New York can place conditions on that? Like, why would we allow there to be conditions on the exercise of a fundamental constitutional right? One of the moments in the oral argument I was most impressed by, this was, this was Brian Fletcher, who's arguing for the, for the United States. I thought we did a brilliant job, as did the other advocates. You know, he answered, no, that's assuming the, that's assuming the conclusion. What, what, what this case is about is a right to carry in public without proper cause. And if you frame it that way, it's a very different like unit. It's a very different animal and requires like a very different historical analysis. And I think like the brilliant advocates, people like, like Paul Clement, like Brian Fletcher, and like Barbara Underwood, I mean, these are distinguished folks. They can kind of make those moves like on their feet. And it's, it's, it's tough to see unless you're really you know, uh, steeped in the issues. So this geographic issue of sensitive places was one major theme of the argument. Another geographic concern was about localism and about regional variation of gun laws. And even Justice Clarence Thomas seemed to express some kind of support for a tailored approach to having gun regulations look different in the city and urban areas than they do in, in rural areas. And one question is, how well do you think a New York solicitor General Barbara Underwood did in answering these types of questions. Is this kind of localism approach that even Justice Thomas seemed on board with something that is quintessentially uh, done in a May issue regime like New York has that's diffuse? Or and is it compatible with a shall issue regime? How how could we have a kind of localism, uh, local regional variation in a shall issue context? I mean, I thought this was a fascinating and to me somewhat unexpected theme that just dominated a lot of oral argument time. Um, and it's something I've been writing on for a long time. I wrote an article called Firearm Localism like eight or nine years ago, essentially making this argument that our, 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 that our, our tradition of gun regulation has, for good reasons and with attention to the Constitution, treated gun regulation differently in urban and rural areas. And again, this is before the the, the test of text history and tradition really hit the scene, but it's a text history and tradition argument. Like if you look back at our history, this is what you see, a division between urban and, and rural areas. And it makes good sense. I was not expecting that that argument to get airtime at the Supreme Court in a series of questions from Justice Thomas. But And in fact, the first question he asked, which was about how rural does it, does it have to be in order for you to know you're in an urban versus a rural area, I took to be a somewhat hostile question like, oh, this line drawing is impossible. But then he came back to it later um, talking about, well, Obviously, you can hunt in Rensselaer, in areas of Rensselaer County where the two petitioners in this case are from, but not in Central Park. Like there's areas where, and I was like, what? Actually, I think he's kind of on board with this. And Justice Kagan and a few others were, were, sense, were seemed to be sympathetic as well. Now, not everyone was on board. The, the Chief Justice had a line of questioning, which I think could have gone better um, for General Underwood about, you know, how many muggings take place in forest or something, which is a line I, I'm sure will end, end up in a lot of press accounts of this case. And isn't the fact that, you know, cities are high crime and that there's a ton of people who live there isn't exactly why you need more protection for the for the right. You have more gun rights, people with gun rights in those places. And I just think that the answers to those, again, are just intuitive and obvious. I mean, it, it's true there's more Second Amendment rights holders in New York City than there are in Rensselaer County, but there are more potential speakers and listeners in New York City as well. And it's still going to be harder to get a parade permit to, sh to shut down Fifth Avenue than it would be Main Street in Troy, which I think is the biggest city in Rensselaer County, like because of the population and the interests of other people who are involved there. So I kind of wish that that argument had landed a little better, but I, I can't really fault General Underwood because, you know, I've been writing on this for years and I didn't see it being such a big thing. So uh, my take on this is maybe, you know, this is Justice Thomas uh, and some of the other justices looking for a uh, rule-like way past a kind of functional impasse. So if you think about the arguments and how they went, exactly as you were sort of describing them. How do you code urban versus rural, rural right? Uh, the state wants to say, look, if you're in the, you know, you're in the city, you have more cops around, you have more access to protection, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the gun uh, rights folks want to say, no, it's more high crime, therefore you need a gun more often. On the rural side, you know, the argument goes along similar track, except it's like there are no police and therefore you need the gun more, but there's less crime and therefore you need the gun less. And so maybe what they're looking for, sort of trying to figure out is how how a rule like historically contextualized 
tiebreaker for a functional impasse about how you code the these functional questions about crime versus need. And then also, I mean, like like a lot of legal questions, I think it kind of ultimately boils down to like there's a substantive what should the rule be, and then there's the sort of who should the decision maker be question, like like which level of government should be responsible for which kinds of gun policies, and that to me is not an obvious question. I mean, there are different kinds of gun policies which I think are appropriate constitutionally and just as a matter of you know reason locally, state, or federal. Like if you're going to have manufacturing requirements, they probably should be federal. Like if you're going to have a background check system, probably federal makes the most sense. It's just, again, like you just, it makes more sense the more aggregated it is, the broader it is. But for this kind of law, like a public carry restriction in particular seems to me like the prototypical strong case for a local rule because, and this is going back to something you said earlier, Jake, about like norms, like norms shift and they change, but they are wildly different in Times Square than they are probably in rural areas of Rensselaer County in terms of who carries weapons openly or concealed and, and, and where. Another issue that um, occupied the justices was how this regulation actually works in practice, right? Are people, is New York granting a lot of these licenses? Are they granting few of these licenses? Justice Kagan noted that uh, the challenger's brief was framed as uh, most people can't get licenses in New York to carry for self-defense. And the state came back in response and said, if the court has questions about how it works in practice, then maybe it should remand because this case was decided without any evidence being introduced. Does it seem like there was any appetite for a remand in this case? Did it seem like there were sufficient facts before the justices about how this works in practice? I mean, I think there was an appetite among some of the justices. I think there's a really strong argument for remand, um, but I don't think it's, I, I doubt it. I just given, just counting the, the, the votes that, that appear to be there, I, I, don't, I don't see five for that. But I do think there's a strong argument for it. I mean, a lot of what seemed to be bothering the justices who are skeptical of the law are their assumptions or understandings about how this law works. I mean, you saw that in Justice Alito had this kind of remarkable scene he painted of like, you know, hardworking nurses and dishwashers staying late at work in New York City, and then they want to go home, but they're, it's a violent neighborhood, and they see scary people at the subway. Like, how is it they can't get guns? And the only people who can get them are like, I can't remember, what, what was his list? They're all like judges and celebrities judges or something. Judges and celebrities. And, which, and, and, retired, and, police and retired, retired police officers. officers. Right. Yeah. Which, you know, those are those are empirical suppositions. And if that's true, then, yeah, all the worse for New York's law. But the fact that that record hasn't been developed makes me think that's not a good basis on which to strike down a law. Um, you know, uh, Paul Clement, I think wisely and rightly said, look, this is about my clients. This is about these petitioners. We know how this operates with regard to them. You know, if the court's going to strike this down based on some assumptions about how it operates, then I, I, I think a remand is absolutely appropriate. I don't think it's going to happen, but but I think it would make uh, would make a lot of sense. Right. I think um, uh, Paul Clement said, you know, there's two reasons that I don't think that is necessary. One is that my two clients were denied their right. And the second is that on, on its face, it has this atypicality requirement. And I think the states uh, tried to push back and said, there's not an atypicality requirement. There's a particularized requirement. You have to show that you have some particular need to carry in public defense. And to this point of evidence, it seems like if there had been a record developed and let's say hypothetically that it showed that 95% of people who wanted a license got a license, that would be a different case than if it was the justices looking at license applications which are routinely denied and maybe 2% of the population can get a license. I mean, one of the things it raises really is that th this case kind of maps on interestingly to another complicated division in, in, in litigation and constitutional law, which is the division between as applied and facial challenges. And, you know, in general, an as-applied challenge just means, okay, this law might be constitutional, but not as applied to me. Like, you can't bar me in particular as a, for example, a person with an old nonviolent felony. You can't bar me from having a gun, even if you can usually bar felons from having a gun. A facial challenge is, technically, this law is unconstitutional in all its applications, right? Now, the line between those things is pretty blurry. And, you know, the harder you look at it, the blurrier it gets. This was litigated as a facial challenge. But the way you're describing it there, Jake, kind of heads up the ways in which it could be thought of more as an as-applied. And um, that's a real, you know, maybe for another podcast, but that's a real developing, I think, issue in Second Amendment litigation is the degree to which courts are going to open the door to allow, for example, people convicted of old felonies or people adjudicated, you know, mentally ill because they were involuntarily committed once 20 years ago for depression. Like, technically under federal law, they're for forbidden from having guns. Should they really be? Like, courts are starting to wrestle really with those those little kinds of carve outs. So you could do the same thing for public carry. You could say, yeah, we're going to allow as applied challenges, which I guess actually are already permitted under New York law. So maybe that's maybe that's why, because the, the, these discretionary decisions, as General Underwood said this yesterday, are appealable. 
So Justice Alito did bring up a question during our oral argument about the origins of Sullivan Law, which, to be clear, is not the, ch- the law that's being challenged, but the precursor to this licensing requirement in, in New York and the proper cause requirement. He brought that up and talked about this uh, anti-immigrant and anti-Italian animus here that he thought was undergirding the licensing scheme in New York uh, that was enacted in the early 1900s. And then there was a little bit of a reference um, in Paul Clement's closing arguments to a brief filed on behalf of public defenders of um, New York um, arguing against the law on its uh, on the grounds that it is, is racially discriminatory or has a racially discriminatory impact on communities of color. Was it surprising that there wasn't this wasn't more of an issue in arguments? Given the fact that there, by one count, about one out of every four briefs sort of had touched on the kind of anti-immigrant or racist origins or impacts of this legislation, I was actually kind of surprised that it didn't get more airtime in the questioning. Um, I think it's actually probably right that it didn't get it because there's a whole host of reasons why I think it's a problematic set of arguments, uh, as I wrote in the Washington Post recently. But it didn't get a lot of play. And I think it's revealing in the sense that I, I'm not sure where Justice Alito lands on these kinds of issues because he was pretty hostile to, you know, the idea that uh, we should be really concerned about disparate impacts in particular, for example, in the voting rights area. So to have like a 180 degree where it becomes the centerpiece of a uh, Supreme Court decision about racist history or disparate impacts would might cause a, a, a more than one uh, raised eyebrows. I think we'll get probably a flavor of it in uh, the, the final opinion, maybe as a way of just sort of prodding the, the left on the, on the court. But um, I doubt very much that it will be the central feature that, you know, the Sullivan law had potentially anti-immigrant roots and therefore it needs to be struck down. Did anything else come as a surprise in the argument, either arguments that were made that were surprising or arguments that weren't made that you expected to see? I was surprised about how much attention the localism point got and how quickly the justices sort of focused on these two geographic line problem, line drawing problems of like, how are we going to preserve state regulatory authority in sensitive places? Like, could sensitive places exceptions kind of stand in for public carry restrictions? That would, That didn't... I didn't expect that would get quite as much attention as it did. Um, the localism point, especially the support that Justice Thomas seemed to have for it, caught me a little bit by surprise. Justice Barrett, I thought, asked some really, you know, really, really interesting questions. And I mentioned this earlier, but I mean, she, I think, was sort of obliquely raising the issue of, maybe not even obliquely, just directly, like how much this is just a case that is resolved by Heller and how much Heller itself resolves all of the historical conflict that we see even in the briefs in this case, Um, sort of like an effort maybe to question or maybe suggest uh, whether Heller is precedent with regard to history as well as with regard to law, like that it resolves historical facts. And um, yeah, that that was interesting. It was it was a thoughtful, a thoughtful question. I mean, not a surprise, but uh, but but interesting, I thought. Right. I mean, that is a very surprising question and and actually a kind of bizarre one since the uh, the justices have been kind of on the, or at least some of the justices have been on a kind of promotional tour about how apolitical they are to sort of aggregate to themselves, hey, we can tell you what historical fact is and that's, and pronounce that as a really strange kind of power to assume. You can, you certainly can say, we're not going to revisit the history because what we've said is now the law, but to sort of say that our understanding of the history is also definitive is a really peculiar move. It was kind of funny too when you like pair it with Justice Breyer, who's still clearly upset about Heller and the historical determinations the court made there. He brought it up again at oral argument today. Well, when we heard McDonald, which is a 2010 case, the historians there told us we were wrong in Heller and they didn't mention other stuff that's come up even since then, like the rise of this corpus linguistics analysis, which like big data approach to the use of language, which again kind of cost, you know, cast some doubt on some of Heller's central holdings. But you know, I, I think maybe that's maybe that's Justice Barrett trying to suggest we can sidestep this because we've already decided it right or wrong. It's precedent. I was actually also surprised. You know, usually the justices, especially when they've got a kind of sense about where they're going, try to fish out if we do X, what is it going to look like afterward? So I kind of expected more more questions about what would a constitutional shall issue regime look like. We got a little bit of that about that, but not a whole lot. And I found that really surprising. 
Yeah, there were almost no questions about what kind of training requirements a state can have, if there have to be limits on how much a state can charge for these licenses, whether the state can require you to pass a written test to get your license. None of the kind of questions about what kind of objective uh, things a state can put in a system, which you might think, uh, and I would have thought too, that this would be something the justices would probe, because if they don't deal with those things now, at least in some general way, then you could easily see this case back at the court in two years challenging New York's new shall issue regime. One thing that's interesting, too, I mean, the training requirements point, I just want to underline that. Daryl's been sort of thinking and writing about this recently. I think it's hugely important. And especially if if the result of this is that we shift to something that looks more like a nationwide shall issue regime, like the question of training requirements, I think is going to be a really big one and, and a hotly litigated litigated issue. Another thing that like didn't really come up, but um, again, maybe New York could have done more to push back on was Clement's theme. I think he even put it this way was like, you know, the, the basic point of this case is we want what they're having, what the other 40, what he count by his count, 43 states have shall issue a permitless carry. We want that. This is an outlier. You know, New York is sort of like a almost like a lingering, you know, I really it would have been nice, I think, for New York to point out like just the speed and the recency of deregulation and that just, uh, you know, 25 years ago. New York was in the majority of states to have some version of May issue. And that this is playing out against a backdrop of just really rapid deregulation at the state level such that, you know, it may be an outlier today, but not historically speaking. And, um, you know, I think that's that's tough to get a lot, all that into oral argument. But it, it didn't seem to me that the, the justices of the parties maybe were attuned to it. So it's always made hard to make predictions about what might come next. But do we get any hints from this case about what types of case the court might want to hear next, or what other issues should we be on the lookout for? Certainly, I think if this licensing uh, regimen goes down, and especially if we, you get something that says to the effect of either you have to license or you have to have open carry, or but you can't like ban both, I have to believe that the next set of questions are are going to be about like, well, what kind of guns are protected, right? So, you know, is it all right to show up at a rally outside the Capitol building? with your AR-15s. I think that will definitely be on the agenda next and made even more relevant and important once this case comes down. Yeah, I agree, man. And there's there's active litigation already about classes of arms prohibitions, whether it's like large capacity magazines or, you know, assault weapons bans, however they're, however they're defined or however they're, however they're labeled. That I think that's got to be a, a strong candidate. I mean, one that kind of jumps up the list that I, had, I would not have put near the top of the list before, but after oral argument today, I'm thinking twice about would be litigation about the sensitive places. Like we have actually not seen that many cases testing what Heller meant when it said that guns can be prohibited in sensitive places like government buildings and schools. You know, there's a, there's a big 10th Circuit case about post offices and post office parking lots. There's one about Capitol grounds uh, in D.C. But the justices really seem focused on the places. Like, you know, in addition to the arms, like where are the places where you can take keep guns out? And um, I, maybe one of those come, you know, bubbles up next. Um, those those laws have done well so far, but um, but but maybe who knows under a new test? I mean, the, the other point, I guess, is just that if the court changes the methodology to this text history and tradition test, it may want to do what it did after Heller and just let things percolate in the lower courts for a while to kind of see how it see how it works. And I should say that there are two cases uh, that the Supreme Court has been holding in anticipation of what it's going to do in the Bruin case. It's holding a case called Young versus Hawaii about um, Hawaii's open carry licensing scheme, which is very similar to New York's and what it requires of applicants, but it's for open carry instead of concealed carry. And it's holding a case um, about New, New Jersey's ban on magazines that hold more than, than 10 rounds. And so those might be one of the next cases that the Supreme Court wants to take up. Or if it does something with the methodology in this case, it might remand those cases to the lower court to decide how they work with this new test. Last question for you all. Um, how might the oral arguments or this case more generally inform or influence any of your upcoming scholarship um, or the way that you interact with students in a classroom setting teaching about these kind of laws? I always think that, that Second Amendment cases, and this is a great example, are a, a perfect way to talk about really deep issues and how law gets formed. Yesterday, we could, we could, I could assign the transcript and use it to teach, like, here's the difference between rules and standards. Like, here's the difference between, you know, judge-made law and, you know, and uh, judge-made constitutional law and statutory restrictions. Here's how the two interact. Here's how background shifts in norms, something you mentioned earlier, Jake, can sort of filter into the way we do constitutional doctrine. It'll be, you know, depending on how the opinions come down, a lot of those themes may be at the forefront or not. But but even just based on the oral argument, I'm I, I'm sort of like re-energized as I always am about using firearms law as sort of a vehicle to talk about 
not just constitutional law, but how like law works, like how 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 law gets formed, how doctrine gets formed. Um, and you know, all, every conversation that I've had about the case since the oral argument, including this one today, is like it just sparks new ideas. And you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully that translates to the classroom. For me, this has become an, another data point in what I've often taught in my civil rights. Uh, litigation class, which is civil rights litigation is like a small part of a, an entire civil rights sort of ecology. And this is a prime example of that, right? It was activists, gun rights activists getting elected, putting pressure on local governments, state governments to change the laws about concealed carry that ended up creating a, an outlier situation for New York. And now that is the framing that's in front of the Supreme Court, which is, as they said many, many times, doesn't seem to be so bad in these other states. So why is New York retaining this antiquated permitting scheme? And that can't happen and wouldn't have happened if you didn't see this sort of small d uh, democratic kind of activity in many, many states. And for me, I didn't even have, I mean, I had the good fortune to be teaching the day before oral arguments uh, the session of the Second Amendment seminar that covered sensitive places. I didn't expect this to have such a big role in the arguments, but we really saw the justices grappling with what makes a place sensitive. Justice Alito was pointing to maybe it's the security measures that are undertaken in the place that make it sensitive. And Paul Clement, the, the challenger's lawyer, was not really on board with all of that. He said maybe it's the place itself, characteristics of the place itself. And so I think that is something that uh, will continue to, to spark discussion among uh, scholars and, and lower court judges about what, what makes a place sensitive and when the government has authority to restrict guns to that place. All right. Well, this is really a terrific discussion. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much, Dave. This is a really great questions. Yeah, this is terrific. Thanks. And thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of the Duke Law Podcast. As the executive director of the Duke Center for Firearms Law, I invite you to follow us on Twitter at Duke Firearms Law and on the web at firearmslaw.duke.edu. You can also subscribe to our blog, Second Thoughts, which you can find on our website. We'll continue to follow this case and others like it. Also, be sure to follow and check out other episodes of the Duke Law Podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. I'm Jake Charles. Thank you for listening.